So let's start the afternoon session here. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Professor Anil Gupta. He's a professor at the Center for Management in Agriculture at the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, and executive vice chair of the National Innovation Foundation, which is dedicated to making India a global leader in sustainable technologies. He has started many different initiatives, and I think today probably he will talk to us about his Honeybee Network and a few others. But he's a fellow of the World Academy of Art and Science and recipient of the Padma Shri National Award for distinguished achievements in the field of management education and the Science in Peace Society Award from the Indian Science Congress Association. Uh, he received his BS in Agriculture from Haryana Agriculture University and PhD in Management from Kurukshetra University. It's my pleasure to uh, invite uh, Dr. Gupta. Professor Gupta. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. I will share with you a long story in a very little time because Dr. Mashilka has already introduced many things that we do. But there are a few more things that I must explain. This is the way the story began 25 years ago. A Honeybee Network essentially tries to uh, provide connectivity to the people who are nameless, faceless, gives them the network connection, and then they become, they have an identity. That's what we do. We look for creative people all around the country. We identify them, we source them, search them, celebrate their achievements. At the last count, we had about 174,000 ideas, innovations, and knowledge practices from 545 districts of the country. If a proof was needed that India is creative, this proof is available in abundance. Uh, there are some pillars on which our dream of making India a leader in global technologies, sustainable technologies, press, which is this bridge uh, is made of the roots of trees drawn from two sides of a river in Chirapunji, Meghalaya. We walk every six months. We have Shodhyatra. We just had our 31st Shodhyatra in Vardha. From Sevagram we started and finished it on 12th. So during that Shodhyatra, we walked on this bridge made of roots of the trees. And to me, this symbolizes the ultimate in sustainability. There's everything in it is renewable. There's nothing practically zero entropy in the system because it's all reorganizing, self-organizing system. And there are three elements in this uh, possibility, this technological possibility. One is that technology is like word, institutions are like grammar, and culture is like thesaurus. We need all the three for making it happen. If you focus only on technology and forget about institutions, sustainability is not possible. If you focus only on technology and institutions and focus about culture, there is no endemicity to it. There is no endogenousness to it. There is no incorporation of it in our belief system, in our uh, uh, worldview. This is an example I would like to show you how our society organizes and manages excellence. We are walking in Parulia, West Bengal, Parulia, Bankura, and we came across these beautiful terracotta horses under a tree. We asked the potters, why did you keep these trees uh, these, uh, these horses under a tree, I mean, somebody could break them, somebody could take them away. And they said, no, we didn't keep the beautiful ones, we kept the best ones. Why did you keep the best ones? So that when our children walk by the street, they know what the current standard of best is, they should do better. Open source standards of excellence. This is also one of the values that this country has produced, which we have to emulate in our life and be able to live by it. So essentially what Honeybee Network is doing is, it is trying to combine passion, purpose, performance. But all the three require platform. And we have created several platforms. Sashti was the first platform, created in 93, then came Gyan, and then National Innovation Foundation in 2000. And there are, the, Dr. Mashilka mentioned about inclusivity very well. I'm just trying to summarize those as I understood. He was talking about inclusion at the level of spaces, regions which are bypassed, we should be able to reach those regions. Many examples were given by the speakers earlier, how they are trying to provide energy solutions to the places which are bypassed. To the people which are bypassed, to the sectors which are bypassed, and to the skills and knowledge which is bypassed, which is not drawn upon. At all the four level inclusion is required. If you provide me knowledge, provide me some energy solutions, say biomass based gasifier, but you don't ask me whether I can contribute something to the design, then it is not full inclusion. You are including my skills, you're not including my skills, you're only including my consumption. My, my uh, cons consumption basket is what you're tapping at, but you're not tapping at my mind in this case. 
So the last slide that Dr. Mushlikar shared was that we are not just 1.4 billion mouth, but also minds. That means that we should engage the minds of the people. And as I said in the title of the talk, minds on the margin are not marginal minds. They could be very meaningful. So how are we shaping the energy solution? Let me give an example. How some concepts we could learn, which we haven't taken note of at all in our modern architecture and modern way of conceptualizing energy use in our families. There are three slides here. The light is uh, not too good, so maybe I can, I don't know whether you will be able to see them, but I'm trying. On the first one from Andhra Pradesh, Arku Valley, on the fireplace, you have a shelf. On this shelf, you keep paddy panicles, dried paddy plants. When the fire heat, waste heat comes from the vessel, it heats the paddy plants, paddy panicles. The rate at which the husk expands is different from the rate at which the grain expands. When she does the threshing, she has to make, spend less energy. The waste heat of the stove has been now converted into useful energy for reducing her drudgery. Look at what people have done in Meghalaya and Mizoram. There, there are four shelves above the stove. All of us should now recall our kitchen. And in our kitchen, the flue gases, the gases around the vessel, all go in atmosphere. We do nothing about them. Here, they are using that waste heat from the vessel up to the cooking pot at four levels. First level is the where there are small wooden uh, sticks are lying. Wood gets cured and becomes stronger by heat. This is the property of the wood. So they are curing this wood because they use it in the trolleys that are used in Meghalaya for transporting goods. Second one is fuel wood, Chirapunji, which receives highest rainfall. You can't cook food if your fuel wood is not dry. So they are using this heat to dry the fuel wood. Third is to uh, dry cheese, meat, or anything that they want to preserve, vegetables which they want to preserve. And fourth is, as you saw, a bag there, bag of seed, which is fumigated by this heat and the smoke, and pest will not attack it. Four-layer system of harnessing energy from the cooking pot. Where have we seen that? Where have we seen that? So the question now is, will we then think we will redesign our kitchens all over the world? I would say, yes, we should do that. All of us can benefit from dried vegetables. In the, in the season, we have a lot of vegetables. We can dry them and eat them in off season. And that's a very use of, very good way of conserving energy and transporting it for the next season. You're having good food availability for poor people and for the rich people as well. So the question is, we are not just looking at things where they need to learn from us. There are very many lessons that we need to learn from. Look at this. This is a compressed air car designed by Kanak Gogoi in Guwahati. 60 pesa per kilometer is the cost. Let us look at some of these stoves that we have come across. And the beauty is that these stoves have achieved the efficiency levels almost double or sometime more than what the normal stoves are. Normal stove will have about 14% combustion efficiency. You take it to 28%, it is 100% more. You take it to 56%, uh, 200% more. So this is one which uses about 50 to 60 gram of charcoal. And there's a small fan which uses like a computer fan. That's a small cooling fan on the, on the hard disk that you have in the computer. Very little battery that it uses, five volts. And the flame is exactly as a gas. So when you slow down or increase the fan, the flame goes up and down. So you have the gas experience using the biomass. It is from Manipur. You look at this stove, which has 52% thermal efficiency. Normal kerosene stove, which is not ISI, is 26%. The one which is ISI is about 42, 43%. And IIP, Indian Institute of Petroleum, because we have a collaboration with CSIR as well as with ICMR, Indian Council of Medical Research and Council of Scientific Industrial Research. During 2004, when Dr. Mashukar was DG, we signed the agreement between NIF and the ICR, CSIR. So it helps us to get many of these things tested in the best of the labs of our country so that the knowledge and creativity of the informal sector is very rigorously tested and validated and evaluated by the formal sector to generate solutions. This is very interesting. There's about eight different designs of stoves, kerosene stove, which have used two principles. Either you heat the fuel, that is kerosene, or you heat the air, or both, efficiency goes up significantly. So what do they do? They take the delivery pipe of the kerosene from the tank around the flame. You heat up the flame, heat up the kerosene. Or you put a strainer below the burner, and the air which goes on becomes hot because of the strainer is hot, the air which goes through these holes in the sheet becomes hot, and that air, when it mixes with the hot fuel, efficiency goes further. A very good principle 
independently discovered by eight different innovators used in their system, they have raised efficiency enormously and it has been uh, established. Dr. Mushilka mentioned about biomass gasifier. This gasifier has been tested by Teddy and, uh, and at that time they judged it as one of the best ones. Uh, it has gone to South Africa, Kenya, Germany, Italy, Singapore, again to prove the point that there's a model possible, the globalization can be reversed, not just the technological innovation can be reversed, even globalization model can be reversed from small G to capital G, from grassroots to global markets. That's what we're trying to prove, that it is possible. Not only the large corporation will sell things to small people, which is the conventional model of globalization, you can just put it on its head. There, he has got an order of about 70 units from Meghalaya just recently, and why is it interesting? Because this has used a jacket of water for cooling the whole system instead of, earlier he was using circulating water, now he used the chiller, and the efficiency has gone up because of that. 25,000 rupees per kilowatt. You can now calculate in your own mind as to how efficient that is. Very interesting, this fellow had uh, a bamboo processing unit. He used to make different boards. So a lot of bamboo powder was getting wasted. He made a composite by using a uh, chemical with the bamboo powder and used these fins are of that composite. So bamboo powder has now become a material for very light fins of this turbine. The lighter the turbine fins are and the stronger they are, the less energy you need to turn them around and get that RPM that you need to generate the power. Conventionally, all the turbines that you have are of steel or in some rare cases fiberglass. But that is not in the water, that is also in the windmill. But here by using this, he has really re reduced the requirement of the velocity for generating power. So even if it is very low, because the fins are lighter, they can turn around and generate energy. One of the principles which follows from this, what I call as autopoietic, autopoiesis model of inclusive innovation. What is autopoiesis? This tree didn't know that it is not supposed to branch. By mistake it did. The moment it realized that it has done a mistake, it corrected itself. So you see that it became a stem. In nature, this happens all the time. There's this huge amount of repair going on in our body. All the time our cells are mutating, there are some metabolic pathways getting some disruption coming under stress. Either bypass is developed or that same system comes under stress, depending upon how our body is trained to cope with it, we find ways of finding. are created in our brain to process information. And there are cases where people recover from in irreversible injuries in the brain by merely by making the extra synapses work. So in other words, can the innovations that people develop and that we work with or co-create improve over a period of time in the hands of the users? So it is not a case where the best is already done in the company, now it is going to go down the drain, go, go down the line of disorder. On the contrary, in like nature, as the plant grows, can the innovation improve as it passes through many hands and various processes? So that will be a very autopoietic model. Self-correcting capability and self-improving capability and self-designing capability. All the three possibilities can we bring them into innovation. So let us see how we can learn from MLM heuristics. This is a framework which uh, I will illustrate through many more examples. On one side, you have the domain characteristics in which we have to develop a breakthrough. On the other side, you have technological platforms. Platform may be known, unknown. Domain characteristics may be known, unknown. So take the case of a lunar mission, which has to become a Mars mission. Now, lunar mission cannot be just scaled up to become Mars mission. You can't say, I use so much energy, so much of design to reach the moon. Now, I only increase it by 10 times and I will reach the Mars. No, that doesn't happen because the whole gravitational system of interplanetary moon system in the sky is very different. So you have to reconfigure the whole thing. So it is, these are not the technologies where you can scale up. The logic of scaling up doesn't apply. You have to redesign them. I think many times we do a mistake when we talk about scaling up, we lose sight of the redesign process or reconfiguration process. So if both are known, you can do incubation, not a problem. When both are known, you don't, it doesn't require a great genius. I mean, a small mentoring, a small support will take the innovation forward. The challenge is here. Where both are unknown, you need a sanctuary model. I call it a sanctuary model. In sanctuary model, there is a order outside, chaos inside. In incubation model, there is a chaos outside, order inside. A wildlife sanctuary has a 
chaos inside, order outside. The innovation process, the management process for breakthrough innovations when domain is unknown and the platforms are unknown will have to be a sanctuary model, I will call it, which means tremendous amount of flexibility, freedom, and contradictions to ability to live with contradiction, as you were mentioning at the lunchtime, that you must be able to seek them out, quote the contradictions. You deliberately generate those contradictions because that is the only when the dynamics will be generated for solving those problems. There are four ways in which we can learn from these innovations. You can learn from them artifactually. I'll take the case, uh, one example that Dr. Michel could talk about the windmill and I'll illustrate through that process. You can learn analogically. So one of the innovations that uh, Dr. Michel could gave an award to on 25th March in Techpedia was a lotus leaf effect developed by a student of Jawaharlal Center of Advanced Studies in Indian Social Sciences who developed self-cleaning surface and a technology on the edge absolutely nano finishing of the surface, so the surface becomes clean on its own. You, it doesn't develop any inert material. It takes the, just as a water molecule moves on the lotus leaf, gathers the dirt, wraps it around, and then takes it away from the leaf. This surface works almost like that. A student got an award because it was on technological edge. But he used analogy of the lotus leaf. You could have heuristics, and I'll show examples of heuristics, or you could have gestalt, which is the whole configuration of the factors, including technological, institutional, and cultural, which have led to that particular breakthrough, and you replicate or you learn all of that, not just one element of that. There are four levels at which we can learn. Let us take this case, which Dr. Sir mentioned, and I would like to take two, example, two lessons from it. This is the windmill that was originally developed by Mehta Hussain and Mushtaq Ahmed in Assam, 5,000 rupees windmill, 70 euro roughly. And this is the windmill brought to Gujarat, for salt workers, some of the poorest people we have in Gujarat, who, whose livelihood is the most complex one, who are under maximum debt, and who have the least certainty in terms of dealing with any requirement of life. What was the innovation in this? They asked two questions. Does it matter whether the paddy field, with the help of the hand pump that they are pumping with this windmill, is irrigated in four hours or 40 hours? Second question, does it matter whether the field is getting water in spurts or a smooth flow? The answer was no in both the cases. If answer is no, you don't need a gearbox. Gearbox is one of the most difficult things to maintain in the windmill, most of you know that. And also costly part, the co one of the costliest part. You do away with it. What does it tell us now? It tells us that there are cases where maximizing output per unit of time is not the ideal case, it's not desirable. Now, intuitively, we never think like that. A trained engineer will never be able to conceive of a situation where maximizing output per unit of time should not be attempted. I'm saying, yes, it should not be attempted because it's not a condition here. It doesn't improve performance. If the salt pan is not filled up in one day instead of that, it's filled up in two days, it doesn't matter to the efficiency of the salt making. It doesn't affect the quality of the salt. Then why should I insist that? If salt, the water, the brine solution on the ground is not coming uniformly but coming in spurts because a single wall does it matter the quality of salt? It doesn't affect. Because once the pan is filled, for next four months when the process of salt making will to go on, it would not, salt pan will not even remember how it was filled up. So it's not relevant to the, to the output, to the quality of the output. Why do we put that constraint then? Why don't we ask questions about the very basic assumptions which we can learn from this? So there are two heuristics that Mehta Hussain and Mushtaq Ahmed used which we can learn and apply to totally different domains. It doesn't have to be applied only to windmill. That is the power of, of learning from these examples in a different way. So we also learn from children, of course. We have Ignite Awards where young kids are given awards. We have youngest kids, we have given awards are from, of the age class one and class two. So this is a kid from Calcutta. He talked about uh, rickshaw wala has a problem. He's using human energy and he gets tired, he gets down. You sit in the rickshaw, you feel that, look, I am being pulled by a human being on the ground. He's walking, you are sitting. Doesn't look nice. Why can't there be co-paddling by the rickshaw, by, by the passenger. Co-creation. Now, we use the fashionable word co-creation, but that's what he's doing. It is exactly the model that they have used and found a solution. Look at this boy, class two, Mohammed Hanif Patel from Jalgaon. He did something that many of us may not think about. He, in class two, has anticipated bevel gear by saying that I can use a windmill to run the ceiling fan. Good thought, why not? Why shouldn't a person having no access to electricity not have a ceiling fan? He could have. And doesn't matter, this ceiling fan sometimes runs fast, sometimes runs slow, doesn't matter, it's okay, that's fine. 
So these are the ideas which young kids are thinking about. Here, a student from Sangli uh, Polytechnic can cool the temperature from 35, 30 degrees centigrade to 5 degrees centigrade by half an hour of cycling at 14 kilometer per hour. Normally, we walk at 4 kilometer per hour. So that means you are walking four times faster. That's what cycling speed is. In half an hour, you can bring temperature from 30 degree to 5 degree. So if there is a case where you need something to be kept cool, a vaccine, a medicine, or whatever, and it's a very critical stage of the patient, and there's no other way in which you can keep it cool, here is a solution that will keep the medicine cool. This is another example, very interesting example. We, uh, I, whitewash was going on in my house, and I found that a whitewash, uh, the, the worker had a cut in his hand. He went out, came back, and the blood was not oozing out anymore. So I asked him, what did he do? So he, went, he told me that he used the spider's web for, as a coagulant. coagulant. So we, I told our, we have a natural product lab in Srashti. So we discussed our colleagues. Our colleagues then did a, did a, developed a cell line because we didn't want to kill spiders every time. So we took a cell line from the spider's uh, uh, gland and multiply, I mean, cultured it, and we developed the coagulant. But there's another interesting possibility. The protein that you have in the cell line can be a very powerful source of energy. If you have an airbag in a car, an airbag, when it absorbs the energy, it comes as a shock. But if you have an airbag of a silk of this spider's web, it will be very soft and give you much better rescue, much better shelter. Uh, safety. So silk fiber is far better in terms of energy absorption, and that is no less important a problem than any other fiber in the world. So we could develop now a factory of developing the silk fiber from of spider's web, spider's uh, uh, fiber that he uses for web, and generate energy, uh, energy absorption system. So how do we really now to wrap up these examples that we are learning from the frugality. This is a famous example all of you have heard. And the, the great tragedy is that the people who tried to popularize it called it a makeshift innovation. It couldn't be a makeshift innovation, this clay pan, which uses a non-stick paint. So the non-stick pan that you use in, uh, in the market, after a while, the surface shows up. So where has Teflon gone? It has gone into your stomach and causes all kinds of problems. We give apology to the companies which have developed this chemical, because it was not supposed to be eaten. But our kind of cooking is such that we really need to hard frying and turning and stirring. So that makes the metal show up, and the chemical has gone somewhere. In this case, because it's a clay pot, clay pan, there are pores, there's no issue of scraping. So it is cheaper, it is more affordable, it is better quality. It gives you better health effect advantage than the costlier one. So when the point that you mentioned about MLM was that it, is, it shouldn't be just affordable, but it should give me more value than what the original product had. This is evident here. But what is important is that various things that he has developed, he has developed a circular kiln. Now, this you cannot do on the side. This is not tinkering. It is systematic research. He has developed all those ideas which will require tremendous complexity of thought. Now, let me take you to another platform we have developed called as techpedia.in. Many of, most of you are engineers here, and all of you did a project in your undergraduate, and you don't know where, what happened to that project. No country on, in the world, unfortunately, till 2009, ever cared about what millions of undergraduate students around the world do. In 2009, we started bothering about it. We said, no, we don't want any student of our country to do what has been done before. We want originality question to go up. So we gave a letter to the students. Hiranmay was a great guy. He was at that time third year student in Surat. He came to me to invite me. I said, no, I will not come unless you do something. I gave him a challenge, put 5,000 projects together. He put 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, 50,000, 100,000. And the question that the process they followed was, went to every professor, sir, do you want your students to do original work? Of course. Sir, how will they do? They don't know what others have done. Yeah, that is true. Sir, give us the project of summary of your students. And every student, every professor got persuaded. In 500 institutions, we got them persuaded. Now we have 157,000 engineering projects at this site. So if you just go to the Techpedia and search there on energy, and right here energy, uh, on the so 
So you will find out there are 5,000 projects done by the students in different aspects of energy in more than 600 different institutions potentially. So what have they done? They have developed solar operated car, black box for vehicle, all these are as available eco-friendly vehicle, tricycle fitted with windmill, can you imagine now? A tricycle with a windmill, so if this wind direction is good, don't pedal anymore. <laughs> you have a car with a sail, that good thought. Can microcontroller, self-driven water pump, PC-based energy systems, pathfinder, robotic green building design, whole range of projects done by students around the country. None of them know each other. Versus, you need an expert for your project in a company. How would you find out who the expert is, except that you will make an assumption that IITs and IIMs have the best people. Well, they do have many good people, but then there are good people in small institutions as well. And they will be, how should we judge the person? I should be judged by the quality of the students I produce. So if you look at the project that the students have done, from who has guided those projects which are in line with your problem, consult them. So we are creating a market for the merit, which means more democratic, more participative, more decentralized, more distributed knowledge management in the country, and that will generate us an option of different kinds. So what kind of projects are coming out? This is project, Dr. Mashkirk had alluded to that, a wheelchair, a manual wheelchair using human energy to climb without any power source and IIT Kanpur. This was incidentally awarded by GE also last year. This is an award which was given this year, sir, in IIT Kanpur, 25th March. A laser ignited ignition source. Why is laser ignition more important? It is important because the conventional system, which is you can change, influence the plasma, the combustion of linear mixture, higher lifetime, lower NOx emissions, all that is influenced by when you change a spark plug, plug by the laser ignition system. There aren't many engineers in the world at the moment which are ignited by the laser. That's the fact of the matter. So it is technology on the edge and coming from an undergraduate student. But we never tracked it. So there's nobody wanting to invest in it because they, we are not even looking at this technology. Let us look at another technology. Professor Murthy, who is now Vice Chancellor of Central University in Karnataka, we met him a few days back. He, he said, look, I didn't realize I spent 25 years of my life in this technology. My student got an award from your side this time. This is the first time this work has been recognized because we could see that. What has he done? Single phase AC generator for rural electrification. And this is extremely important because the cost at which it is able to do is unimaginably low compared to the other AC generators that you have. Game changing, completely game changing technologies which are available here. This is the award Dr. Mashilkar had given, 11 Bhatt of Seva was also on the case unavailable. And what does it do? It develops the first successful effort on design and development of 5 kilowatt, 50 megas, 22, 30 volt, 4 pole single phase AC generator. Now, he may, we may not even be knowing about it. Yes, I'll just close. I want to close with this example, last one. All of us have refrigerators in our house. And all of us know that refrigerator has a compressor. And compressor gets heated up. And this heat goes into atmosphere. Not one company in the world has ever designed a refrigerator which uses the heat of the compressor. Fact, that's the truth, right? What did this boy do? This fellow, Dhruv from Asana, asked a simple question. Why don't I put a heat exchanger alongside the compressor? Take the heat away, make a hot chamber, get you the hot water and the hot chamber where you can keep the food warm and when you take the heat away from the compressor, its life gets extended, it works less, it consumes less electricity. 20% less electricity. This is MLN. MLN. You are getting less consumption of power, you are getting more output and all by an undergraduate student. This is the power. I will not go into other examples. So, engage, involve and become a part of the green future. Honeybee Network invites you all to be joining us with us this effort. We have a lot of other examples, herbal pesticide, veterinary medicine, and essentially this is the triangle which is a challenge for us because all the three things very seldom happen at one place, one hand, one institution, one person. So innovations are somewhere, entrepreneurship is somewhere else, investment is somewhere else. How do we do that? We have already sold things all over the world. Demand is coming from 62 countries. Grassroots innovations have a market around the world. How did it happen? Srashti came about, showed the atras, and upon, essentially, as I told you, Srashti gave rise to Gyan, NIF, uh, and more than 600 patents filed by the NIF, more than any one institution in the public system, I suppose, and uh, for 500 projects supported, 
64 technology transferred to the 79 licensees uh, all over the country. So what is the lesson? One lesson is future sources of learning, creativity, and innovation would not be restricted to formal boundaries of organization. That is the reason we are here. We will have to look out, outside the organization. G chairman is reported to have said that my R&D team is not 8,000 engineers that I have. It's 8 million engineers around the world. Anybody working in my space, there I am interested, is part of my R&D team. That's the way of thinking. I like that statement because if PNG said that, that by 2012-13, more than 50% leads for new products and services will be coming from outside the company, not from R&D system. So this is very clear. Open innovation platforms are here to stay. And different kinds of incentives are required. Let me conclude by saying that the mind on the margin are not marginal minds. Never use the term bottom of the pyramid because it only focuses on one pyramid, which is economic, in which they are at the bottom. But when you look at ethical pyramid, you look at innovation pyramid, you look at institutional pyramid, many of these people that we have talked about are actually on the top and not at the bottom. So, thank you so much. Yeah, questions for... Yeah, that's interesting. I think you must have clarified everything to everyone. Oh, there's yeah. There, yeah. Uh, two of them, yeah. Well, I'll be very quick. I'll be very quick. Most of the time, uh, we've, I mean, throughout the presentation from the morning, throughout all the presentations from the morning, we are always hearing of, you know, lower cost and perhaps things like that. Some examples you have highlighted of cutting edge technologies. See, one of the biggest problems facing Indian businesses today, whether it is Infosys or any other company, we are always, we are stuck in this middle income trap. Software, we are almost being somewhere in the coolie segment. Even in some of the energy space, they're just processing some stuff and sending to some various countries. And if you have to transit this middle income trap to this top end of the innovation pyramid, so as to speak, how do you, how, do, how does one go about doing it? I mean, this is, of course, all the presentations still now have been brilliant. I mean, you, you have said that People, bottom of the pyramid uh, term is wrong. It should actually be these people are actually at the top of the value pyramid, at top of the intelligence pyramid. But the problem with most of the Indian companies, bearing a few, is that we are all stuck in this so-called middle income trap. How do I break this barrier? It's absolutely a, a glass ceiling facing most of us. See, one of the suggestions I had visited from one of the companies on which Dr. Mashuk is on the board, and they visited us yesterday. And when I, I asked them a simple question, I said, how many patents did you file? They said 47. I said, how about filing, uh, getting uh, ownership of 470 patents? He said, no, no, we can't scale up from 47 to 470 in the next five years. We have to go maybe 47 to 60. I said, that's the problem. This is the answer to your question. If you acquire 10% equity by investing, let's say, a lakh of rupees in each of these technologies that are in your domain and which are of relevance from this database, at a very small cost, you can get 470 patents in your hand, isn't it? 90% let the equity be with the innovator, 10% with you. You have a model now that where you have got a huge number of technologies available to you at a very low cost because you're investing in early stage, depending upon how you incubate them, how you give them the sanctuary for growth and development, many of them will become successful, some of them will not become successful, but you have a chance of making breakthrough. There are engines that we have talked about which have never been developed before. There are ignition systems which have never been developed before. So there are technologies which are breakthrough technologies as much, potentially. Who is investing that? How many people have taken the, out of the award that we got? We got about nine technologies which got traction after 25th March that you recognize them, which is a good thing compared to before. We never got that many queries as we got this year. So there's something changing in the Indian uh, economy, I must tell you. People have started looking out. I'm more optimistic than you are, <laughs> but yes. Sir, just curious about this bamboo, bamboo co-polymer thing that you showed. Yeah. Is that those examples, are they kind of one-off or the people actually kind of take it beyond their application area? So this was a remote place in Nagal and Mokokchang. So did that guy actually go and implement it somewhere else? Or do those stories basically end there? Well, Imli Toshi's brother is an architect. Okay. So what happened was that he was making the board out of these bamboo uh, particles. And it occurred to him, because he was also interested in making a small turbine, there are a lot of streams in the mountains, as you know. So it occurred to him that why can't I use it for that purpose as well? So he 
developed this composite and used it and found a good result, hydrogen it called. Uh, there are not too many examples of this kind, I must admit, because they don't have access to those compounds, those chemicals. Their repertoire is not as expanded as one would wish to. So we have created a fab lab with the help of MIT Boston, where we have both mm -hmm. mechanical part we have added to it and, and electronic part. So you have 3D printer and all of those things. So our hope is that when our innovators get access to modern, modern tools, and I'm talking to Benny for a long time that, look, you should get engaged now strongly with our network because we need, we need modern concepts, we need modern tools. Only then the imagination of the innovators will expand. You know, they have been using 30 or 40 year old materials, most of the cases. Tools are very old. They don't have access to the new tools. So therefore their imagination is constrained to the extent by the tools that they have access to. have been patented. We have, uh, you been referred to the grassroots innovation or the uh, Techpedia? Yeah. Techpedia is by the students. Right. And grassroots are by the people who have never received formal education, much except fourth class, 10th class, 8th class. So there are 600 odd patents from the grassroots <laughs> level. And one was granted to us a few days back in US. We have got seven patents granted already in US. One was for typhoid drug which has shown activity against those strains of typhoid by, tested by ICMR lab in Kolkata, virology lab, which were resistant to all the known antibiotics. So we got this patent only two days back. So there are some patents of technologies which are performing as good as that. Uh, there was a, one of the first few, tractors, first few uh, patents we got in US, one was for motorcycle-based flying machine, right. uh -huh. and one was for tractor, three-wheel tractor. Tractor is a mature industry, as you know. Nothing great has happened in that industry for the last several years. And in that industry, if an innovator from Banji Bhai got a patent, he must have done something great. So it was a tractor device which could make a tractor three wheel or four wheel, depending upon the terrain that you have and the function that you have, the gap between the crop that you have. So patents, yes, but we also have a very large pool of open source technologies. We have a fund called a GTIF, Grassroot Technological Innovation Acquisition Fund. We have 70 technologies listed at NIF site, nif.org.in slash GTIF. There are 17 technology listed there for which IP has been acquired from the innovators to make them available to small entrepreneurs at no cost or low cost. <laughs> so we want to be the largest provider of open source technology in the world. That's our aspiration because the patents are a very small part of our business, but we do care for this. What do you see the role of uh, venture capitalists or angel investors, which is typical uh, in the US in, in those areas? And specifically, do you have any connections to the, these kinds of firms which are in the New York or Boston area? Yeah, in India, we don't have angel fund. Let us be very clear. If anybody tells you that there's an angel fund activity except for IT sector, then he's misleading you. There is no angel funding taking place in this country. Otherwise, there should have been a queue of people who would like to invest. Uh, when it, but we have a macro venture innovation fund, which was set up in 2003 to provide funding to innovators who want to become entrepreneurs under single signature. No co-obligant, no guarantor. So it is not microfinance, it is micro venture finance. You have heard about microfinance all over the world. When did you hear about micro venture finance? Never. Not one document on finance will talk about micro venture finance. So the question that you're raising is absolutely on the edge. That if innovations require risk capital at medium to large level, they also require risk capital at the community level. So your point is absolutely valid, but this has been a missing link in our country, unfortunately. Yes, sir. So when you were uh, talking about uh, the uh, stove with the four levels of shelving to recover the heat, uh, I was thinking uh, if I went back home to the U.S. and suggested to my wife that we do that, um, I would not get a very warm reception. <laughs> and so, you know, is that merely a cultural difference? Is it that... Uh, in the U.S., we live in a society that's so wasteful that these minor, uh, perceived to be minor uh, improvements in efficiency are, are not uh, considered. But I, I think that coming up with those kinds of innovations in the West, where we would never think of using them, is difficult. What, what, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, first of all, uh, if you use that, if you have, if there's a young couple, and has a young kid whose clothes get wet and it's a monsoon season, they're not getting dried up, you could also use that shelf for drying the clothes <laughs> of the little kid because that fellow will need to change it very often. And uh, what I believe is that, yes, it is possible that 
in your society, maybe at this moment they're not realizing it. But when they realize that there are different levels of recovery that you're making of the heat, and this recovery can not only save the world at large and the environment and climate change and whatever have you, but also can uh, provide a good solution for, let us say, food preservation. So you have excess vegetables. You don't want to eat it when it is stale. Uh, after two days, it becomes stale. You don't want to keep it in a refrigerator for too long. If it is dried up, say, you make the slices of vegetable, tomato or, or, or bitter gourd or whatever. When they are dried, they become very good snack. You fry them, they become beautiful, one very tasteful snack. Dried vegetable is a well-known snack in our countryside. So you can do that. So the new taste will have to be cultivated. Icons will have to be persuaded to popularize that in their lifestyle advertisements and lifestyle programs and cultural programs. Mm -hmm. Television will have to play a role that this is a healthy way of living. Every ounce of, every joule of energy that we are wasting should be recovered. A student last year, Dr. Mishalga gave an award to that person from COEP Pune, College of Engineering. That fellow took the exhaust pipe of the car or the truck. I put the same concept, heat exchanger alongside, use that heat to cool the driver's cabin. What is wrong with that? Tell me. If the fuel consumption in a big logistics company, which has huge number of fleet of trucks, and if they can reduce their fuel consumption by 10, 15% by using the waste heat for cooling the cabin, what is wrong with that? In this time when economy is in downturn, I think the market is looking for such solutions to my mind. And we should really encourage them to engage with our kids who are really brilliant in this regard. Because in our society, every home, I'm sure every Indian will agree here, in every home there's a corner where we keep things which we will use someday, isn't it? Even if you don't need to use them, you can afford to buy them, but you still will keep the old carton of the tea in one corner because sometimes you may put something in that. Isn't it true, sir? We, we have this in our sanskar. This is our value. We don't believe that there is anything called as waste, truly speaking, though the lifestyles are changing. So I think this is something that we can co-learn and hopefully make the world better. So, so on that note, let's give a big round of applause to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs>